I'm Josh Cooperman, and this is Convo by Design, with the kind of architect you love to hear from and I love speaking with, both craftsman and creator. What's the difference? Years ago on the show, you heard from a friend of mine and former high school classmate, now amazing chef and restaurateur, and award-winning chef and restaurateur, Steve Sampson of Rosa Blue in Los Angeles, he explained to us that he did not consider himself an artist, but a craftsman. He wasn't interested in creating new dishes, but instead wanted to take his customer back to Italy with a regional focus. He wanted his food to make you feel the way he did when his grandmother made this for him. Architect Daryl Wilson is a principal designer with Mark Weaver and Associates. He is both craftsman in the sense that if a client wants a Hollywood Regency style, for example, he can create an original design with historical accuracy. Wilson can also ideate an original idea for his more adventurous clients influenced by modern ideas or traditional, but something completely unique and something that is a one-off. There's a big difference between artist and craftsman. No less important, but a big difference nonetheless. There's a huge difference in creatives who can straddle both worlds. They're rare. Daryl Wilson is one of them. And you're going to hear from Daryl right after this. For well over a year now, you have been hearing incredible conversations, interviews, and panels with amazing creative talent as part of our Wellness and Design Thought Leadership Series presented by Thermosol. It has been and continues to be an absolute joy working with the entire team at Thermosol from the top down. This multi-generational family business has been producing the gold standard in steam generators, saunas, steam showers, and steam shower accessories for decades. Thermosol is the original steam shower with technology that is state-of-the-art, made and manufactured in the United States. The company's history with steam showers started by David Altman in 1958. Murray Altman acquired Thermosol's steam bath division in 1989, and the company is now led by Mitch Altman from their world-class production facility in Round Rock, Texas. The most successful designers and architects are using steam showers to maximize wellness, relaxation, and enjoyment for their clients. Thermosol is a staunch advocate for the design trade, and I am so proud to have them as a presenting partner of Convo by Design and the Wellness and Design Thought Leadership Series. If not familiar with the entire range of Thermosol products, please check out thermosol.com. So it has been a while, Daryl, since you and I have spoken, and I, I love catching up with you. I, I actually wanted to start in an interesting place, um, if you'll indulge me. I, I love our conversations, and I love when we talk about architecture. And what I have found doing this podcast for you know going on nine years now is that my conversations are always influenced by news of the day and things that are going on. And I had a con- I, I just finished having a conversation about this very, this very issue, but I was, I'm a little groggy today. I was up late last night watching a Beverly Hills city council meeting as they discussed the uh, certificate of ineligibility for one uh, 10,001 North Roxbury. And I don't necessarily want to talk about that property because, you know, it, it is what it is. Um, but I kind of wanted to start with architecture. And I wanted to start with, you know, and I have said this before, that I feel like designers and architects really are futurists. Um, you define the, the manner in which people live, not necessarily for today, but designers, you know, 20, 25 year time horizon, architects, I don't know, 75, 100, 150. If, you know, I wonder if the, if the European architects figured that, that some of these, you know, basilicas and some of these structures would be up, you know, six, 700 years after they were created as an architect. 
what is iconic? What is what, what is worth saving? As an as a Los Angeles based architect or Santa Barbara, I don't know. Are you in LA or Santa Barbara? We're we're, we're in Los Angeles, yeah, but we yeah. work all place. You know what's what's worth saving? Well, I, I think there are a lot of things worth saving. I think it's a matter of what what do we see as culturally valuable. I think it's very important that we don't lose sight of the past. Even those things which we find a little questionable, they inform how we how we see the world. It's like the googie architecture of Los Angeles. Very whimsical, very out there, but that kind of whimsy doesn't happen in architecture anymore, nor do the methods where they put them together. But I think if you look at that, I could probably find a very thin thread that takes you to a point like a Frank Gehry in terms of whimsy, in terms of architecture, in terms of like, how do you, how do you manipulate the envelope how do you manipulate how people use space in order to do that? So I think it's important that you, you see those things that happened before to say like, you know, architecture is not four walls in a, a room, you know, and we, they're, they're supposed to inspire. So I, I think it's important to, what's iconic? Okay, so I would say that I, um, our office is in, in Los Angeles. Across the street from us, we have a norms. And it's a classic Googie norms piece of architecture. I think you have to prefer, you have to preserve that. Now, when you start to talk about something like LACMA, which is currently going through a renovation, um, and a lot of the miscellaneous pieces have been removed in order to do this whole new grand scheme. So, I, it's, it's a, you know, there are certainly people who are attached to, were attached to some of the older buildings because that was a very representative of a time and a place. Um, but there's something that's supposed to be new and improved, you know, that's going there. So I, I don't know if I'm answering your question in terms of what's iconic. Um, it's funny because the, the question isn't fair. And um, I'm I'm only asking it, and it's not it's not fair because I'm I'm asking it knowing full well that you can't answer it. But what I think is what I think is surprising, and where, where, what I've been thinking about all morning, is that you know this conversation, watching the conversation last night, it was it was a heavyweight street brawl, is what it was. Um, billionaires fighting with other billionaires and millionaires over a piece of property that, you know, in the, in the heyday of, of old Beverly Hills, where you had Lucy and Desi on one side and Jack Benny on the other, pretty interesting. Esther Williams apparently was swimming in, in the swimming pool as this whole thing was happening. I mean, really, really interesting. And it got me thinking in advance of our conversation, because I, I do love our chats. Um, yeah that architecture is is an art form and many view it strictly as utilitarian not as an art form whereas you know with my with my past history with jazz when i was working with playboy and covering the playboy jazz festival it, that's an art form it could never be it could never be called utilitarian it was always an art form and architecture and design are very much the same way. And, and anyway, so I'm going off on a complete tangent this morning, but it is really nice to see you. And so, you know, for, for those who have not heard our conversations before, um, remind them of, remind us all of the, the origin story. And you've, you've been with, with Mark Weaver and Associates for, for quite some time. So my, my origin story, yes. So. I always loved architecture and design, and I studied architecture at Princeton, got licensed, moved to New York, worked for several larger architectural firms. But one of the things that I found that was not satisfying there was that you were part 
of a huge team that walk, worked on a very small component of it. There wasn't, I didn't have the opportunity to do a holistic design, be part of the holistic team where you had a little bit more in charge. So I had a friend who had an interior design office and I started working for him um, just sort of to help out. And, you know, when I was unemployed and it really clicked. And so I, in 1996, I moved to LA to go to art school. Um, got an MFA at Otis College and worked with Sally Serkin for a while, you know, a couple of other designers in LA. And then I came to work with Mark. And my, my, my you know, I did the licensing in the architecture part. But I really like the idea of residential interiors and architecture. I mean, we don't, quote, do architecture, but we do architecture in my office. So we very much, you know, collaborate with clients from ground up, from renovations to just, you know, decorating. So it, I, I love the broad expanse. And I think it goes back to, if you think about Frank Lloyd Wright, Frank Lloyd Wright was very much someone who wanted the complete control of the interiors, the exteriors, and all of that seamlessly fitting together. That's what I like about being on this side of design in terms of residential design. I feel like there's a little bit, some architects would argue that it's not true. You have a little bit more impact, you know, and how, how someone so? lives. Go ahead. How so? Well, in my in my architectural life, there was a very there was almost this imaginary barrier where it was very this is the contract, this is what needs to be done, and and on the interior side, it's you're learning the life of the family. You're learning the life of your clients and you're, they're becoming your friends in the process. And there's a, there's a, there's another level of richness that comes out of, of that, that, you know, sometimes we joke that, you know, architects do really beautiful vessels sometimes, but they don't quite, at least with residential interiors, they need to work with interior designers because interior designers know like, Oh, they're going, they're going to want a big fluffy sofa or they're going to want a form roll very, you know, rigid, you know, sort of layout of the sequence of rooms. And it's all about that, how you really live in a space as well as design a space. Does that make sense? I'm not. You know, it, it's really interesting. It, it makes perfect sense. And I, I think what's interesting too is we are in this, this renaissance for design and architecture because people have realized that there is a greater importance now, right? That, that both form and function are actually very important because when, it, you, look, you don't miss something until it's taken away from you, right? right? Until you no longer have it to rely on anymore. And I think for the first time in people's lives, they, they were in a situation where couldn't leave the house. And if you're stuck at the house, then you really, you don't find out a, how a house lives until you're stuck there and you can't leave. That should be a total reality show. If we, if we, we would probably watch it if we hadn't lived it for three years, right? But I'm curious because ha about, have your conversations changed in that regard? Do, do you have more detailed conversations about how the house lives now, how the house, because a, a home, look, let's be honest, any dwelling, anything you design, it's a machine. Yes. It, it, it's a machine. You and know, how does it work? Function, it has to function as they use it, you know, the doors, the windows. And I, I want to backtrack a little bit with the architects. So we had, you know, a couple of architects that we really worked well with. And we worked on a couple of projects recently with Wade Weissman's office. Yeah. You know, they, we, there's kind of a joke in the office because the project architect and I will spend two or three hours on the phone 
discussing issues about a project. And it's because there's this, this, this synchronicity, this connection between what we're both trying to achieve. You know, it, it's, it's, you know, I sometimes think we, we separate architecture interiors. And when it really works, they're, they're kind of seamless. Okay. I get that. At the same time, <laughs> okay, you have some it's not, it's not a, but it's not a, but, okay. um, you, you had mentioned something, uh, and I am a huge fan of the Googies. I love the Googies. I really do. Um, you know, Norm smells the standard oil gas station on La Brea. Um, I, I'm a, I'm a huge fan and is it iconic? Maybe, maybe not. But what it does is it strikes a chord when architects could be a little crazy. When the exterior design of a space like the Brown Derby was like, hey, let's give it a try. Yeah. You know, um, we don't seem to have that, that same fun loving, experimental spirit in design. So when you're talking, you know, when you say that, I, it just kind of, kind of makes me think that, you know, I would love to have that, to see kind of that fun loving experimental idea return to the exteriors where it seems to be most saved for the interiors at this point. And so that kind of collaboration is interesting. Well, I would ask you, what would you say of the Peterson Museum? So, um, I love the Peterson and I, I've covered, I, I wrote about it for form. Um, sure. what I love about the Peterson is I get it. I get the spirit of it. I get the, especially at night with the idea of brake lights, you know, I, I, I get it. I understand it. I love seeing a race car and a monster truck attached to the exterior facade of a building. Okay. I just, I think it's amazing. And for what it, for, for the, the purpose for which that particular building was designed, I get it, love it. I think it's totally cool. Now, was that the right answer? Well, is there a right answer? Well, no. So, but, but I would say if you, you talk about whimsy and I don't know, and the googies and all, I don't think you can, I'm not a, you know, so I, I came of age in postmodern times. So postmodernism, you know, references to history and all that stuff. And so there are a lot of sort of buildings with swags on it that I designed in graduate school that I would never do now. Um, but if you look at someone like a Zaha Hadid, her, their office, I don't know if I call that whimsy, but I'd certainly call it a vision and a, and, a, and a stretching of the imagination. And I do think there are architects who do architectural with a capital A, and then there are architects who do building and everything in between. Well, and it, it reminds me because I have heard a conversation with you where you are, you know, you are designing and re-envisioning and reimagining spaces within a within a ship, within a very large boat. And I draw the, the correlation between the two because I find it so interesting. The idea of space and when space is taken away, it requires a different set of tools to think through it and it requires one to think differently. You go back to something like the Peterson, which is a broad expansive space on the corner of two very, very busy streets. So it's a, it's a, it's on stage basically. So you have a much, you have a much larger surface area within which to work. Um, I would, I would it's LACMA as well, which is what you're know, right across the street. Um, I feel like, Los, I, I don't feel like I, I'm pretty convinced about this. You know, Los Angeles 
is in a is to me is someone who grew up in the San Fernando Valley, a kid in the 70s, a teenager in the 80s, who grew up seeing many of these changes in architecture where Southern California is a it's a testing ground where mm -hmm. architects can go and try new things and someone will come in later and it's like a it's like a architectural etch a sketch you know you'll just shake it out and shake it's it. gone and then <laughs> you know and then you you start again and i think because of that there's the good um mid some of the mid century stuff amazing some of the you know some of the the test homes the case study homes amazing um you know what it would have been like to be at the parties with with Neutra and Schindler, you know, and and having those conversations to see what Neff was talking about, as you know, as to see Wallace Neff in his heyday with with the the Gillette compound, right, and then at the end of his career, you know, dying in his la in the last bubble house, which is weird, but again, you know, what an interesting idea for someone who, who designs this way. Being in that environment, how do you how do you temper your creativity now? And and where do you still get to be as creative as you want to be? Well, I, I don't know that it, it, you know creativity because we are doing something for someone. There, you know, you know, I don't think creativity is without parameters. So in some, you know, with a business, you have clients and that's one of the parameters and depending on the personality, the budget, whatever, you have a certain amount of creativity and freedom. So I don't know if it gets tempered or if it just gets directed in a way that works for that particular instance is how I would phrase it. Because, it, you know, I, so I'll transition a little bit. So I, during the pandemic, I was fortunate enough to, I bought a little piece of property out in Joshua Tree. So uh, it's land. I have to, I, I'm going to build something on it. It has been the most challenging thing for me because if there's ever an effort, an, an opportunity for untempered creativity, it's that. You know, I can do whatever I imagine there, certainly within budget constraints and all that, but it's difficult to do without parameters. You know, you know, it's like, you, you know, it's like you can do anything you want. What are you going to do? You are listening to my conversation with architect Daryl Wilson. We'll be right back. We are living in a time of incredible growth, both technologically and creatively with respect to interior design, exterior design, and architecture. There is no question. There are companies thinking differently about the business of design and how to make products super serve those for whom they're being made. One of those companies, and one of my favorites, is Moya Living, designer and fabricators of some of the most stunningly beautiful, incredibly durable, and highly functional kitchen, bath, and outdoor kitchen cabinetry on the market today. Powder-coated steel with stunning lines, vibrant colors to fit any design style or aesthetic. A history of designing cabinetry for the scientific community. So you know it's been tested in some of the truly the most harsh conditions available. Moya O'Neill is the CEO and founder of Moya Living. She's the inspiration behind the design. Designers, their specification process is so simple. It will make your job so much easier. Check them out online through the socials at Moya Living, their website, moyaliving.com, and in the real world, their live kitchen showroom in Fountain Valley, California. It's, it's, not, it's funny because all the questions I have for you today are virtually unanswerable. So sorry <laughs> about that. Um, but what, but be, the reason I'm, I'm asking is because um, the work that, the, that Mark Weaver and Associates does inspires me. I am inspired by the work. Um, do you guys, does the firm work as a collective or is it individuals? Is it a team sport or is it an individual sport for everyone it, within? It's very much a team sport. 
Now, just like in on an A team, you have some people who are forward, someone, you know, you know, so and it oscillates. So, you know, we'll frequently sit down and talk about things and go like, hey, you know, that's not such a good idea or this is a fantastic idea. And then someone may walk by and say, you know, you really should look at, you know, so and so. And so it's very much a team sport, you know. We have vendors that we work with all the time that fabricate a lot of our stuff. So Mark may check on a piece. I may check on a piece. Blakely may check on a piece. And each time each one of us goes to check on it, you know, you may have like a little bit different perspective on it. So I think it's a great, it's like, you know, basting a roast. It, it, it enriches it. You keep flavoring. You keep changing it a little bit. So in the end, you end up with this really wonderful product, you know, and I think we're fortunate that our clients allow us to do like, you know, really imaginative stuff. Well, and I, and I say that because the, like I said, the, the work that, that, that the firm does, it, it inspires me and it inspires me because you have, you have some firms and it's not, it's not taking a shot. At anybody, you know, there are firms that specialize in a look yes. where you know what you're getting because that's what they do. Nothing wrong with that. I, I do think, though, that being nimble, flexible, and creative enables the ability to make someone look at something and think, what if? So when I, you know, when I look at the work and I compare three projects in particular, right? And, and I compare and contrast, I'm going to talk about some others, but, you know, to, to compare and contrast Bird Street House. Okay. Against Hilltop Hollywood or Hollywood Hilltop. Okay. Against Summit Ridge. Oh. So three very, very different. Very different. Styles where someone would look at this and say, you know, I would love to meet the three architectural firms that, that crafted these three unique, you know, that, that worked on these three different styles. And it, there's a certain skill set, I believe, that goes into both crafting a style and perfecting it and perfecting the style in which you're working on at the moment. It's very so different. I important thing for us is the ability to edit, you know, and tailor, you know, if you look at each of the projects, there's, there's a certain amount of restraint that's in each of them. Um, and each of them also has like an element of modernity to them. You know, it's very subtle in the background. What, you know, some, you know, um, the, I think Hollywood Hilltop is, yeah, is a little bit more forward leaning contemporary, whereas the um, Bird Street is a little bit more eclectic. And then the, what was the term where you mentioned? Um, Summit Ridge. Summit Ridge. Summit, you know, so, okay, I'm going to talk about Summit Ridge for a minute. Summit Ridge was, um, I don't know how the clients came to us, but husband and wife, and they had an agreement that we'll live in a more contemporary house for a while, you know, and after we've been there X amount of years, then we have to go to a more traditional house. But each one of them would have elements of the other. So we met them after they were coming out of a contemporary phase. So it, it's interesting to like, oh, so, you know, from the exterior of the house, it's a classic Mediterranean house, very California. Um, and, but they have a contemporary art collection. Um, the house, had traditional elements, but we wanted to push it. If you look at the kitchen, it could be in a very contemporary house. If you look at the living room, there's, you know, the, the antique fireplace, but they're sort of 
contemporary elements around it. So it's about that mixture and finding the balance and what was great and what was the sort of creative parameter for, for that project was we had to find that happy place between the two of them. And, and what's so fun and fascinating for me is especially when looking at three different completely different styles of design is I, I feel like there's something really interesting to the through lines that you'll see almost like fingerprints in the work. Um, and I'm not name dropping, but it's, it's an important reference. I was talking to Bunny Williams okay. and and, you know, one of the one of her famous quotes has to do with the fact that she would like to design work and people come in and not know who the de- who the designer was. Yeah. Right. And I from the very first time I read that quote, I always found it so counterintuitive because any creative should want their work to be known you know, intuitively who did it based on what it looks like. And then I really started to think about it. And it's like, you know, it's more, it's, it's almost a more creative endeavor for someone to be so nimble and flexible and creative in what they do that someone couldn't possibly guess that it was them because it wasn't just one style. You know, you look at a Wallace Neff, you see a Wallace Neff, Gillette, Doheny, you see it, you know what it is. Um, you know what style it is, you know who did it. But to do something like that, but the thing that you can't hide are these really unique telling through lines that are in each of the projects. You know, and when I look at those three projects, what I love about it, it's a, it's a game. It's so much fun for me to look at something like that and then to say, they're so different, but the the use of you know the the biophilic elements bringing the outside in and doing it in a way where you'll have a you'll have this classic mediterranean architecture but you will still have a contemporary opening where the whole entire wall is gone yeah. that's not something you find in a quote unquote traditional mediterranean but when you do it at summit ridge it completely works each of these particular de- elements of design, they all have that indoor outdoor that is Californian, classic California design. Yeah, yeah, I think you're doing yourself a disservice not to take advantage of that. You know, it's, you know, I grew up in Florida. Now people try to go indoor outdoor, but it's, it's a bit humid for that. Yeah, but but products have changed. And I think that's the other element to the creators who stay on top. But what's interesting too is this use of water. Um, each of the three projects has water. And, and one, I think it was the Hollywood Hilltop. There's this, what I loved about this in particular was there's this little outside niche under a window. And there was a, between a wall and a window where you found a way to incorporate A pond. So the pond existed before we started the project. And, but it was very much one of those custom pond fountain things you can buy on. It was, it was not special. And the client was really, really wonderful. And he, he wanted it to be real. So I remember we were there and it's like, we're placing the rocks and, you know, these big shelves and stone and the steps going through. And one of the elements that I also love about that is we hired an artist to do the entry gate, a local California artist, John Krasik. It's that sort of undulating metal gate on the outside so you have is that a, that's a so that's a gate not a door that's a gate that gate goes into the area with the pond so the front door is actually the same wooden glass system that looks out on LA so you have that transparency on one side you're looking at LA 
And then on the other side, you're looking into this wonderful little pond. I love that. And I love the gate. And you know, it's, you know, it's interesting too, is everything else is so geometric that having something that is just so organic really yeah. does set it off because your spatial planning on this, man, you didn't, you did not have a lot of room For on the front little, side. Yeah, it was very, you know, it, we work with, you know, a great landscape architect and play them wild and we really collaborated with them and the client very much on what that feels like. As you, you come in and you sort of step down the hill into the house, across the pond, and it's just, it's a really fun experience. And, but when you, once you go through that gate, you can see into the house. You can, you walk in and you see the dining room, the dining table, you know, those, those beautiful, you know, Vienna glass chandeliers. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, did the same designer who did that gate do the front door of Malibu? Of Malibu, yes. Same, same designer? Same, same, same artist, yeah. See, oh, same artist. See, that's what I'm talking about. And I, I love that. It, again, the same, it's not the same. It's very, very different. But there's a, sim there's a similar through line to this sleek metal exterior and then this organic metal door. It's just, I, I, it's not, and it's not in the color. It's a different, it's a different presentation for Malibu. Yes. And I love that too. And then, and then, you know, if I'm going to make one comparison, then I'm going to have to go and compare that to Senna Inez. Oh. which is which is so much earthier and so it's just it's a completely it's a divergent view but again you can see very many of the similar through lines i just i think it's fascinating so i i think our through line you know it's kind of you know so we have one client that has several homes and spanish colonial you know historic nantucket houses you know, a Paul Williams house in LA, you know, you know, a beautiful place in Miami that's kind of, you know, Miami Spanish deco. So each one of those projects, we kind of do a deep dive into what is the most authentic thing and what could we take a little tangent and bring a little, little update into it. So with Sandy and Ed's, for instance, you know, I spent many, many, many hours flipping through old books that had missions, doors, furniture, all that. And a lot of the, the, the detailing of that, the organicness of it comes from these books where they were, they were literally sort of black and white line drawings of furniture, or there would be a, a picture of a gate at a mission. And there's actually the doors to the master bedroom in Santa Inez. Um, we found this picture and it was in a mission. Um, and we said, oh, we want to duplicate these. So we take them to the cabinet maker. And one of the guys in the shop says, oh yeah, I know those doors. I know, I, I've been to that mission. You know, so he was the guy that got to recreate these doors, these beautiful sort of, those multi-paneled, you know, Spanish influenced doors that, you know, the average guy doesn't build anymore, but he got to build it. And that was so exciting for us to have someone who had the level of skill to do it, but also had the, the sort of relationship to it that could really bring the spirit of that, that, that piece to it. And that's one of the things that I feel like has, has come out of this major, look, anytime you have this, this cataclysmic event that we've all been through, you can't help but change. And it's just a question of how, how things change. How do you change personally? How do you change professionally? How do you change architecturally? And we're going through all these changes now. And I feel like the return to the artisan is something that is, yeah. are you seeing that? Well, we, that, that was, I mean, that's what we do. We, we, 
we make a lot of our own furniture. We do buy from showrooms, but the artisan at this level of design is, you know, you have to have that. You, you can't, you can't do the level of design and have it executed without an artisan that that knows that the stitch on a, a on a pillow or the stitch on a sofa needs to be a certain proportion or you attach you know in a certain way or someone who's going to craft a case good knowing how to turn a leg or to lay out a veneer it's all we I mean, I love what I do, you know, so we, we go, we'll go down to the veneer shop and, you know, uh, I asked the guy one day, it's like, how many, how many different veneers do you think you have here? He says, we have about 2000 of the, the regular stuff, but then there's the other stuff that I, that's really special that I'd have to go pull up. And it's just, it's like, a, I'm like a kid in a candy store. It's just all I see are opportunities for creativity, different ways of putting things together. And, but that person will tell me that, oh, if you're looking for something that's going to give you a starburst versus, uh, you know, a burl look, you should look at this one versus that. So there's a certain level of, of knowledge that I have to rely on from other people, from these artisans who will tell me, who, who will really give me a way of making what I'm conceptualizing shine. How have you, and when I say you, I mean the firm, yeah. how have you adapted to the lack of materials, the lack of qualified individuals to do the work, the, the time delays, you know, and, it, and it's something as simple as you can still have a, a, an amazing woodworker. Um, you know, they can, they can turn the legs, you can get the fabric to build, but uh, you know, if you're, if you don't get the hardware, if you don't get slides, if you don't get joints, if you don't get, you know, right. some things you can't, you can't finish. How have you adapted to that? Well, most of the people are, it, 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 most of it is just, it may, instead of being eight to 12 weeks, it may be 12 to 24 weeks, you know, in terms of production time. Yeah. You know, they're just delays. We generally have enough good sources that if A doesn't work, there's a B, but it's not really an A and a B. It's like, a will give you this and the other A will give you that. And, you know, there, you know, the one thing we, we've always approached things is that there is no one solution to any design problem. So, you know, and then there are things, I mean, this has always been the case in terms of, you know, you may design something, you, you, you get down and you're looking at it and you go like, it's not really what I thought it was going to be. So how do I, how do I move? How do I how, how do I change this? So it, it's not like it's wrong. It's not quite there yet. So we tweak it. We manipulate. A lot of times on things we'll do, if we're doing multiples, we'll do a prototype. We look at the prototype and we go, eh, needs to be a little deeper, a little wider, a little whatever. Um, so I don't know that other than having a little bit longer lead time on things, we've just been able to be more flexible about the, 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 the pieces in terms of their outcome. So if we can't get a product that we initially thought we're trying to find something equally as good as a replacement. I would also imagine that, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I imagine that the majority of your projects, you're not, you're not talking about one or two years. You're talking about a much longer time frame. Well, it, it depends on the project, you know? So if we're doing a house ground up, it's more than one or two years. Um, if we're doing, well, sometimes if we're doing a renovation, it's more than one or two years. Um, but for instance, if, 
it's a condominium, it might be a year, you know, so it's a much more controlled. So right now, in terms of projects in the office, we have a condo in the Wilshire Quarter. We have a house in Miami. We have the Nantucket houses. Uh, and we have a project in Montecito that's a guest house for one of the, but it's Spanish colonial. We have the Nantucket places are classic, you know, um, historic, clabbered, really wonderful uh, buildings. And then we have several projects in Montecito and several projects in LA. Um, and they all have their parameters. Well, and what I was getting at is I'm, I'm curious, what are your clients asking you for now versus what they were asking you for three years ago? I have, I don't, I don't, not specifically, you know, colors and materials per se, but a, as the machine runs, you know, what, are, what do they want the machine to do now that they weren't asking it to do before? Well, I, I think, and this goes across the board at any, you know, level of design with homes is people want to make sure that if that they have a space that if they will want to, or if they need to, they can work at home. So it's very comfortable. It's that, that, that strict demarcation between lit life and work has changed a little bit. You know, you know, there was a time where it's like, oh, I'll have a home, you know, I'll have a home office, but it's for me to just sort of write a couple of checks and pay bills. You know, now, I want, I mean, I may be in this room for a, long, a lot more time. And, and I think we're still in that mode where people are, you know, I have friends that they're still, if they're in banking, they're doing these sort of modified schedules where you go in three days a week and then you work from home two days a week, you know. So it's, it, it means that the home has to be a little bit more, amenable to working and that that you know we've always done a little bit of that I, I think it's just a little bit more important now it's really interesting too because when i when we talk about you know a home as a machine it's or any dwelling for that matter it's just a different it's a different way of thinking about about this and and what i what i find so fascinating is that i don't think and i'm curious your take on this but i don't think that the evolution of architecture and design is is going to stop changing anytime soon oh it can't you know i mean if you look at just the arc of you know the 20th century to now you know, it's not a whole lot of time. It is some time. But, you know, if I think about my my parents, they had ice boxes. You know, they no, there was no sub zero. There was there was no frigidaire. There, or there was frigidaire, but it was an ice box. You know, you know, you know, Mark tells a story. He remembers when, you know, his neighbors got a TV. You know, I remember when we went from black and white TV to color TV. Now we look at it and, and this is, you know, people watch movies on their phone. Homes now, you know, you can have a TV on your refrigerator. So things evolve and change and they become smarter. Um, but I also think that that will have an effect on how we put them together. What that is, I don't know. Yeah, big time. Um, especially considering that the exterior data networks are not equipped to have homes be entirely smart. I mean, you can't have your refrigerator, your washing machine, your range, your light bulbs, everything be smart draining off of a, off of a Wi-Fi network without having a mesh system put in. How do you think about that now as it relates to the, the design of a house? 
Well, it becomes, you know, there's an interesting sequence of events that happen with homes. You know, typically you, you, you get the spaces, you set them up, and you then start talking about all of the infrastructure that needs to go into the home. More than likely, at some point in that process, the client gets a little frustrated because it's like they're not seeing anything. All they, they have studs and they have all these wires in the wall and we're talking about where the, the keypad is. Is that a touch panel? Is it a keypad? You know, how do you have to, and it's, it's, not, it's not ultimately what's going to like make them happy. The function of it will, the, all the technology, but then you, you start to layer on the design, the drywall, the, the, the finishes, the moldings, all of that stuff. And you see how seamlessly it can be integrated with the design. And that's when they start to really appreciate it. And I do think that, you know, as you say, not everything can be smart in the house right now, but there is a leaning towards that. And we do have clients that don't want it. They, want, they don't want their house to be smart. They want, they want to go to a light switch and hit a light switch and it turns on the chandelier or it turns on like, you know, the sconces. So it, it varies. So last question, which is, which is a, a fairly personal one. What are you going to do in Joshua Tree? Oh, that's the, <laughs> that's the million dollar question. You know, it, it's interesting. It'll definitely be contemporary. And I oscillate between having this little tiny house that's big enough for me and, you know, a partner and a dog um, and having somewhere that I can entertain. Um, and it's, it's really, so my lot, it's, 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 it's like the t- crest of a hill and then down into a little valley. Um, it's two and a quarter acres, um, really beautiful, not a whole lot of development around it. So it's hard to, it, I, I almost want a constructed tent. I've always had this, this desire um, to sleep in one of those tents with the, the skylight over it. So I, I kind of want to bring that feeling into the architecture where you really you just got an enclosure around you but you're really out in nature you're gonna that, you're gonna you're you're gonna design a yurt well no yurt, <laughs> no yurt so I don't a modern that. yurt <laughs> <laughs> how about a geodesic dome that would totally fit in there there are some out there there are some, <laughs> uh uh geodesic that's it, I like walls. You know, I like walls where I can paint art. <laughs> I just think, you know, especially Joshua Tree is one of my, um, it's funny because this is a podcast, so you can't see it, but Daryl, you can. Behind me, you can see my green screen and, and it's still got the image of, there's this spot in Joshua Tree. There's this, it's between the 10 and the 40 um, that is a shortcut between Vegas and Palm Springs. So going between Modernism Week and Palm Springs to KBiz in Vegas, you take this shortcut and it takes you right through Joshua Tree. And it is one of my favorite places. It's just, it's it's amazing. I love Joshua Tree. So when you mention that, it's like, yeah, you can, and you can do anything, anything you want. You know, I, I, and for years I've been going out to Joshua Tree and you, I've stayed in, you know, the sort of, um, what do they call them? The, um, the cabins, homesteader cabins, you know? So there was a history and I don't know the complete history, Joshua Tree, there were these homesteader cabins where they're literally a cabin. Some of them have water, some of them didn't. Um, way back when the hipsters started buying them and renovating them and making them into Airbnbs. And, you know, so you get, from that, from the unrenovated to the renovated to these new contemporary, you know, you know, really beautiful architectural places that are just, they're just stunning out in that landscape. 
So it is. And I'm let's keep in touch on that. I would love, I cannot wait to see what you do out there. <laughs> I can't wait until I figure out what I'm going to do. But is it, is it funny? Are you the guy who's like, you're the, I, I hate to make the analogy, but it's the only, it's the only one I know like this, where you're the, you're the pool cleaner with the dirtiest pool in the neighborhood. You're, you have to, you, you work so hard on the projects that you're doing for your clients that you don't really maybe focus on the one that's for you. Do you mm-hmm. neglect your own housing needs? Well, I would say no. So, you know, I have a little place in Hollywood, a little bungalow. It's on a walk street, classic, you know, but I did a modern take on that. So it was, you know, down to the studs, new ceilings, new, like just space, new cabinetry, you know, so I don't spend as much time, but this is, this is a big one because it's something I can do from the ground up, which is, that's part of, there are no, there are, I could do a geodesic dome. I could do a Frank Gehry. I could do like, you know, you know, Scarpa, you know, it's, you know, there are all these references that keep coming to my mind, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright, you know, and you just, you just have to, you know, read through them. Yeah. Fair enough. And I can't, I can't wait to see what you do. Daryl, this was great. Thank you for making the time today. I loved it. Thank you. If you've been listening to Convo by Design for a while now, you have heard me tell you about Article. Great style. Really, it's as simple as that with Article. Things have been challenging for design professionals and their clients for, what, two years? Two plus years now? You know this already. What you might not know is that it doesn't have to be if you're looking for exceptionally beautiful modern furniture. Article provides a simple and easy way to creating a beautiful modern space because Article works direct with their manufacturers on production of unique and stunning pieces. Then they work directly by providing this well-crafted design directly to you. This direct relationship means you aren't wondering where your furniture is and you're getting it for an incredible value. What could possibly be better than that? In many cases, the shipping is flat rate, which means no surprises right? Even more, their culture and service are rooted in their core values. Customer obsession, doing it differently, ownership mindset, winning together. If you're a designer, architect, or residential developer, you must check out their trade program. Discounts, special support, and exclusive perks. Article has the beautiful modern furniture you're looking for at an incredible price, at an incredible value, and you need to check them out. Check out article.com, or if you go to the show notes, there is a specific link which will take you, if you're in the trade, directly to their trade program. You have to see it to really believe it. Thank you, Article. Thank you, Daryl. I appreciate the time, and I am in awe of your talent and skill. Thank you to Convo by Design partners and sponsors, Thermosol, Moya Living, Article Furniture, Franz Wigner, and York Wall Coverings. And thank you for joining me every week for these conversations. I do hope you enjoy them as much as I do. And and give yourself a mental hug right now because, man, we are all living through some very interesting times, personally and professionally. It has gotten much harder to do business, create wonderful and sublime spaces. But remember why you do what you do and for whom you do it. Your clients depend on you and you make their lives a little bit better. Check back here every week for more stories of design professionals and creatives who are doing this at a very high level. Get some new ideas and inspiration to take your firm to the next level. Until next week, be well and take today first. (laughs) 